Coming up on Doctype, learn how to wrangle that sloppy copy with some CSS3 multi-column layouts. Then, ever wondered where jQuery plugins come from? We'll show you how to make your own. So break out the beanbag chairs because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Squarespace and Barcamp Orlando. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that wants to learn a little bit of coding or a developer that thinks everything they make looks like crap, Doctype is here to show you the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help you take your next project to the next level. So speaking of the iPad, which I don't think we were. No, nobody was talking about the <laughs> iPad. But I was okay. talking about the iPad. Last week, <laughs> Apple released their recommendations on developing for the iPad that's, in Safari. That's right. And they actually had specific references to the video and audio tag. They don't want you to use plugins, which you can't use anyway. Obviously, there's no, no flash. Right. <laughs> but they, they made specific <laughs> reference to the video and audio tags. And this is interesting because on the iPhone, you can't have uh, you can, you can use the video tag, but it doesn't play in the browser. It actually plays full screen, which on the iPhone makes sense. Yeah, it's a smaller form factor. So with the iPad being a bigger screen, it can even maybe accommodate that space. Do we? We're hoping that maybe the video and audio will actually play inside the page, but right, it'd be it'd be really cool if the video would just like play right in the page on the iPad because you could do a lot of cool like multimedia things, especially with like print publications. Yeah. But. I don't know. I mean, sometimes you might want it to play full screen. It's kind of hard to Maybe say. Maybe it tap, but uh, you know, it, there may also be like the annoyance of something like auto playing on the iPad. Right. Apple probably wouldn't have that. So they they weren't really clear as far as what the video and audio tag will actually render in the iPad, and we don't have a simulator to test it. So we'll have to check that out on April third. But today we are talking about jQuery plugins and and CSS three multi column layouts. Oh my. Historically, CSS hasn't provided very good tools for laying out a web page. We've had to use things like floats and absolute positioning and other various hacks. It can be so frustrating that it's no wonder people resort to using tables for layout, even though they know that's not best practice. Now, while no solution could be perfect, CSS3 multi-column layouts are pretty nifty. The basics of CSS3 multi-column layouts are pretty easy to learn. Here's how it works. Inside of a block level element, like a div, create a few paragraphs of text. Each paragraph should be wrapped in a p tag. Then open your style sheet. In Mozilla, apply the property moz column width to the parent element that contains the paragraphs. In WebKit, we use WebKit column width. Then all you have to do is set the value to a unit that describes the width of the columns. And like magic, the browser will split the text into columns. It even chooses the appropriate number of columns. Now, if we want a specific number of columns, we can use the column count property. In Mozilla, use moz column count, and in WebKit, use WebKit column count. Then set the value to an integer that will tell the browser how many columns you want. And that's all we need to get started. So now that we have some columns, let's see how we can use them in our designs. Let's say you wanted to put some borders between your columns. Because the columns aren't selectable elements, there's a special property just for that. In Mozilla, type moz column rule, and in WebKit, type WebKit column rule. Then use the same arguments you would use for a regular CSS border. Add a unit describing the width, type the style of line you would like to use, and then add a color. In practice, columns can really improve your site's typography. For example, on a site like Wikipedia where there's long lines of text running across a page, it would be really nice to have some columns. Now, just as you need to make sure that you have line height on your paragraphs, you should also make sure that you have some space between your columns. Here's how that works. If you want to adjust the spacing between each column, use the column gap property. Use moz column gap for Mozilla and WebKit column gap in WebKit. Then set the value to a unit describing how much space you want between each column. This will help add some white space to your site and it'll make the content a little bit more readable. Finally, you'll want to be careful about having columns that are too tall. To adjust the height of your columns, simply adjust the height of the parent element. The multi-column layout module in CSS3 has been undergoing a lot of changes lately and browser makers have been working very hard to try and keep up. We'll revisit multi-column layouts in a future episode of Doctype. 
Squarespace is hands down the easiest way to get your site on the web. I mean, how many times has a friend or family member asked you to build them a website? Come on, you're good with computers. Send your friends and family over to Squarespace and let them build the website of their dreams. With Squarespace, anyone can build an awesome website in minutes. They can fully customize every part of the site, edit the CSS, and they can import their existing blog into Squarespace. Squarespace lets you get started with a two week free trial. You don't even need a credit card. If you want to continue using Squarespace after the trial, do yourself a favor and use the code Doctype and save yourself 10% off the lifetime of your order. Not only are you saving yourself time and money, but you're helping keep Doctype on the air. Check them out at squarespace.com. If you've ever used jQuery before, you've probably used a few plugins, but have you thought of creating your own? It's a lot easier than you might think. One of jQuery's greatest strengths is how easy it is to create plugins. Anytime you have more than a few lines of code that applies to multiple places on your website, you'll want to create a plugin. Plugins are a great way to organize your code, even if you don't plan on releasing it publicly. We're going to show you a simple skeleton you can use to create your own jQuery plugins. When we're building a jQuery plugin, we only want to add the code that we need and not interfere with any outside code. We don't want to create any global variables or functions, and we don't know what the environment's going to be like, for instance, if the dollar sign function is still going to be alias to jQuery. That's why we're going to do all of our work inside of a self-contained module. All of our code is going to go inside this code. What we are doing here is creating an anonymous function and immediately executing it. Any variables or functions that we define in this code will not be visible to the global scope. Remember to use the var statement for your new variables, otherwise JavaScript will make them global. We also have the anonymous function except one argument. We bind it to the dollar parameter inside the function and pass it the jQuery variable from outside the function. This allows us to use the dollar shortcut for jQuery even if the global environment doesn't choose to do so. The most common type of jQuery plugin is a method that can be applied to a jQuery collection. When we decide what to call our method, we should make sure that the name is clear and that it probably won't conflict with another plugin. The name of my plugin will be double click to hide, and it'll make all the elements it's applied to hide when it's double clicked. It'll also add a stylish border with a random color. You'll be able to pass an optional speed argument, which will be how slow the hiding effect is applied. If you pass nothing, we will set the speed to slow. To declare our method, we assign a function to the $.fn.doubleClickToHide property. Replace DoubleClickToHide with the name of your plugin, of course. Anything you define in $.fn will be available to jQuery collections as methods. Inside of this function, the this variable will be bound to that collection. So if the plugin was invoked on a collection of all the div tags, the this variable would be equal to that same collection of divs. To help us create a random color, we create an array of colors to choose from and a helper function that selects one of those colors at random. We'll be using this later. The variable and function are only visible from inside of our plugin. So now we've declared our function and some helper code, but it doesn't do anything yet. Now we actually have to implement the logic of our plugin. Our plugin, like most, will operate on every element within the collection. We also want it to be chainable, that is, it returns itself so more methods can be called. Of course, your needs may be different, but this is a common pattern. We return a call to this.each. This.each will return itself, so our method will be chainable. We pass a function to each that will be called for each individual element in the collection. Inside of that function, the this variable will be an HTML element and not a jQuery object, so wrap it in the dollar function when appropriate. Inside of our each function, we simply create a jQuery object around this and set some CSS for the border and add a double click handler that hides the element. Notice that even though we're inside several nested inner functions, we can still see the speed parameter from the plugin function and use our random color function. So now we just put this code into our page and we're ready to use it. So for instance, we can use the dollar sign function to grab all the p tags and then call dot double click to hide and pass it 1500. Now you'll see that all of our p tags now have a random colored border underneath them, and when we double click them, they hide, and it takes about 1.5 seconds to go. Check out doctype.tv slash plugin for the full source code. Now based on your needs, the source code may need to be tweaked or changed, but like I said, this is just a pretty common pattern. Check out the source code for your favorite plugins to see what's going on. Now that you understand the basic pattern, it should be pretty easy to understand. If you've never been to a Barcamp event, then Barcamp Orlando is a must. It's an all-day event where the attendees are also the presenters. Before the day gets rolling, anyone can post a presentation topic to the big board with a time and place to go see it. Then, you get to pick the presentations that you want to go see. If this is your first Barcamp, we strongly encourage that you present. And you can talk about anything you want, from technology to art or even just washing your cat. Barcamp Orlando starts at 9 a.m. on April 3rd, 2010, here at Wall Street Plaza in downtown Orlando. To learn more, check out barcamporlando.org. 
That's it for this week. Be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype TV on Twitter. And if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. And if you subscribe via iTunes or RSS, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype. So until next Tuesday, remember that every great webpage starts with Doctype. Doctype.